two folks uh, that are either in the room or in the Zoom, if you will. And um, and the first is a really big welcome to Lisha Marshanishan, who is our new executive director to the board. And uh, we had quite uh, an intensive selection process, and she was unanimously um, selected as the executive director and brings just a wealth of ideas and I think some creative ways of looking at uh, the work that DCYF does and the work that we do um, and want to really uh, bring uh, a warm welcome. And I think this is what, week number three, two, three? Uh, four. This is my fourth week. Okay, fourth week's been a long timer now. Um, and I also <laughs> just really want to thank um, the group and the subcommittee for their efforts in not only um, going through the whole selection process, but just being such um, diligent individuals and bringing forth such great candidates and really uh, just want to um, just extend deep appreciation and are so excited to uh, have you here with us at your first inaugural meeting. And um, I know the board feels the same way. And I know you'll have things to say as we move forward today. And then second up, I want to make sure that we welcome and introduce Barbara Serrano, who is now our uh, senior policy uh, advisor um, representative um, for Governor Inslee and focuses really within that role on public safety and is um, replacing Sydney Forrester, who was our other former non-voting member. Um, from the governor's office. And I want to thank Sydney for her work and her contributions and wish her well and really look forward um, in working together with Barbara um, as we are um, uh, members of all of this um, oversight board and her, his, her new role in joining us. Um, and also, I know we have a full agenda today and um, hopefully people are coming with some wonders and uh, some um, ability to kind of question and maybe also do some reflection. And we'll have plenty of time for conversation and for questions and uh, for the presentation. And so without further ado, I am going to pass it on to our new executive director to do a roll call and we will get things underway. So thanks so much. And I'm so glad everybody's here. Thank you, Senator Wilson. So I'm going to begin the roll call. Um, I will start now. Um, so Katie Byron. Present. Thank you. Justice Bobby Bridge. Present. Wonderful. Representative Tom Dent. Representative Dent's here. Good afternoon. Dr. Ben Dahan. Present. Danielle Johnson. Present. Representative Ruth Kagi. Present. Dr. Diane Levy. Here. Lo uh, Lois Martin could not participate today. Representative Tanya Sen. I also believe she was unable to participate today. Um, Barbara Serrano. Here. Wonderful. Uh, Senator Judy Warnick. I'm present. Wonderful. Uh, and then uh, Senator Claire Wilson. Present. Wonderful. So with roll call complete, I'd like to request that the board consider approval of the July 2nd, 2024 minutes. Does anyone have any feedback or edits to make to the minutes? Is there a motion to approve these minutes? So moved, this is Bridge. Second. Great. All in favor, say aye. 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 With that, the minutes are approved. Um, so now I'd like to turn it back over to Senator Wilson, who will introduce the DCYF panel. Thanks so much. And I uh, again, I appreciate everybody being here today. And that's folks from DCYF as well. And um, Today's presentation really reflects the questions, the wonders, and the concerns that have been raised by board members regarding events uh, surrounding the state's JR 25 legislation that was enacted through House Bill 6160 
uh, impacting DCYF's two JR facilities, and that's Green Hill Schools and also Echo Glen. And the recent situations in the news that you've probably been hearing about, in particular, really have focused on two issues. And one of that, um, if those is the recent movement of 43 uh, emerging young adult men from Green Hill Schools and, and DCYF custody to, to Shelton and DC uh, DOC custody on July 12th. And then also um, ongoing around overcrowding issues at Green Hill School, which also impacts what's happening at Echo Glen. So DCYF is here today to brief us and to give us an overview of the events that occurred, talk about the highlight and, and highlight current challenges that are happening within the system, and also talk a bit about what's being done to mitigate future incidents from occurring. So I would like to pass this over to the panel and I'm gonna let you, uh, I, I know y'all know how, what order you're going in, but we've got uh, Ross Hunter today, who is secretary of DCYF and happy to have you join us. We have Jenny Hedden, who's the Depart uh, Deputy Secretary Chief of Staff for DCYF. Um, I don't see Felice, and she may be children. She's here. She will. She will be joining, and I'll. I'll okay, so um, Felice Upton will be here, who mm -hmm. is the Assistant Secretary of the Juvenile Rehabilitation at DCYF. Um, Allison Kritzinger, who is the Director of Public Affairs with DCYF. And then um, Stephanie Boudris, who is the policy advisor um, to DCYF, and then also Robert Wong, who is the Department of Corrections Director of Security and Emergency Management. And I am going to pass this over to DCYF, and you are on. And I think I will ask the board to kind of note questions you might have, because we'll have 25 minutes at the end of the presentation. And... Um, Co-Chair Levy, do you think that um, works or would you um, like to be able to um, ask questions along the way? I just want to make sure uh, we have an opportunity to hear the full presentation right. and don't get short on time. I think um, it may depend too on the presenter if you would prefer having questions along the way or if you rather wait. Do you have a preference, anybody? Uh I can speak for myself and I think Jenny, who will be doing the bulk of your content, and some of the content is weedy and meaty and maybe new. So I think out of just fluidity and creating shared understanding, we are both fine with questions as we go. I worry that if we wait, we may miss the moment. Okay. And okay. So to that end, what we may miss is sort of the end, which is our look ahead to future state decision packages, also hearing from Secretary Hunter. Um, so, you know, that will, uh, he's sort of in the middle there. We'll we'll get through it. But I think just given some of the content questions as we go may make more sense. Okay, thank you well, for that. And, and I, can I just yeah. say like, if, if, as if you're, we're asking questions along the way, you may be able to go a little bit longer. I don't know about your schedules, but we had we have that chunk of time for questions. So we can sort of go into that if you need a little extra time. Yeah, we're all slated Perfect. to be here through the duration of your need of us, so. Thanks and thanks for the joint brains. And, um, you know, I'll keep my eyes open and feel free to use the raise hand function or just step in if you've got a question and we'll try to figure out who's asking. So without uh, further ado, I'll pass it on. Thanks so much. Okay, I am trying to share my screen, Nicholas. It appears I do not have that capability. Apologies, uh, give it a shot again. Okay, here we are. And now I'm gonna try to remember how to put a PowerPoint in Zoom mode and... Okay, can you see this in presentation format now? Okay, great. So what we're gonna walk through today were questions that you all came through. I'm Allison Kretzinger, by the way, thank you, Senator Wilson, for the kind introduction. I'm our Director of Public Affairs, and you noted um, who would be joining. Our Assistant Secretary for JR, Felice Upton, will be joining about 2.45. She unfortunately, um, or fortunately, is with her leadership team today at an offsite doing planning. Uh, as you all know, there is a lot going on, and so she's gonna break away from that for a bit to pop in at about 2.45 and talk about some of the on-the-ground realities um, at Green Hill and be here to answer some questions as well. So I just want to note that that is why she is not with us yet. Um, so 
Here's what we're uh, hoping to cover today and we'll walk through. I'm gonna walk through a little bit of the background. Jenny's gonna walk through the recent realities and some of the data uh, and population trends. And Secretary Hunter will talk about sort of more the, the current state, some of the decisions we were made, decisions made, what led us there that you referenced in your opening. Senator Wilson, we are joined by um, uh, Bob Long, thank you, from DOC, as there were specific questions related to some of the parts of the recent realities that DOC was uh, instrumental in, and they are, do a fabulous job of talking about their approach to safety um, and work, especially when it comes to transfers. And then we'll talk a little bit about next steps. So one of the things we were asked to share was an overview of the juvenile justice system. So I'm going to do it in one slide in a few minutes, which will not do it justice. But at the most high level, want to be able to share what what might a young person experience as they interface or interact with the justice system? So this visual, which is a bit busy and a bit confusing, frankly represents the reality of a young person's uh, in, uh, uh, touch points and interaction with the justice system, beginning at the left there with their often first intersection, which is potentially an arrest by law enforcement. As you sort of move through the top, you can see how a, uh, a process or a case may evolve. And then the bottom gray talks about the diversion opportunities. Um, so at, at the point of arrest, a young person could be warned and released or referred for prosecution. At the point of prosecution, that could continue to charges filed or referred to community programming. Also can be dismissed or reprimanded to adult court, depending on the crime type. Uh, charges are filed, then there is adjudication, right? This is the process of, of, of adjudicating those charges. Um, and that could lead to a dismissal, a not guilty verdict, formal diversion, or a guilty verdict. And then at that point, there's another opportunity for a, deferred, depos a deferred deposition, uh, which means they would they would not likely come to our system, um, or they are, are sentenced, go through that deposition. There could be local sanctions, alternatives, or juvenile rehabilitation. So this is our part right here. At the very end of a journey for a young person through the justice system, um, the timeline on this journey varies wildly by by their by their jurisdiction, by their case, their case facts, by environmental or external factors, and we saw that in uh, especially during the pandemic. So, really, here to set the stage to say where does DCYF have a role in this journey? It's at the very very end after a young person has gone through this entire process. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the recent legislative changes and investments that have impacted the juvenile rehabilitation system uh, and young people who may experience that. As Senator Wilson noted in her opening comments at the top, there were two laws that passed respectively in 18 and 19, which we refer to sort of collectively as JR to 25, that allowed young people who committed their crime as juveniles but were adjudicated as adults to remain in JR care and custody until the age of 25. Uh, at that time, we also see, saw some increased investments in post-secondary and vocational, vocational programmings, recognizing the increase of, uh, recognizing the changes in the population there. In 2021, the department requested and was successful in passing uh, the Community Transition Services Bill, a least restrictive alternative into the continuum of JR, similar to graduated reentry in the adult system. Before, we didn't have that. We simply had secure institutions and community facilities, and there was also mandatory parole for some, a small portion. Uh, when we saw uh, this change to statute in addition to the continuum, we also expanded what we call our community-assisted reentry, and I'll talk about that later. That's voluntary supports, wraparound parole, aftercare for young people who exit JR. Uh, we also have seen focus and investment on focus on institutional education, education delivery, that secondary education delivery in uh, the inst institutional settings. We've seen a few iterations of law and are on the precipice of the task force continuing their work and some recommendations around how we really make changes to that education delivery model inside secure institutions, inclusive of R2, but also upstream in the JDAs or the, the uh, juvenile detention centers, the JDCs, and then some other secure institutional settings that are operated by other partners. In 2020, we saw the passage of the uh, law prohibiting solitary confinement in the juvenile rehabilitation space. Um, we received some additional resource and have been implementing that 
um, and have a whole uh, have reports and a web page dedicated to conditions of confinement if you're interested there, really have done uh, significant work to eliminate, reduce and eliminate the uh, the condition, the time that young people would spend sort of confined in their room. We do not have segregation. We do not have a 23 in one model. That is not a, that is not part of the continuum of DCYF or the reality of care, rightfully so. Um, and so have done a lot of work there on, on that. Aspect, And we've also seen increased investments uh, in mental health and SUD treatment. We know the population that we're serving in JR is changing. It's changing dramatically. The needs of adolescents and young people across our state are, are great. Uh, mental health, behavioral health needs, drug treatment, educational opportunities. We are seeing higher acuity and young people come to our system with much higher needs. This is true of our foster care system as well. And anecdotally, we even see this upstream in our early learning settings. Young people and their families need more to be successful when they have faced adversity upstream. That is true of the JR population as well. In fact, a couple of our, our cottages at Echo run and operate like, um, like CLIP facilities or child's long-term inpatient care, really deep end behavioral health. Because of the need of the population, I will flag, uh, they are not structured nor funded to be that. But those are the adaptions that we have had to make as we respond to the ever-changing population needs in this space. On the bottom here, you see a highlight of some of the staffing realities. We'll talk about staffing a little bit later. We were also asked to provide just what does the JR service delivery continuum look like? What, is the, what, what, what does that mean? And so this slide is intended to depict both the residential and uh, community-based settings that young people will experience or may experience as part of their time with us. We have two secure institutions as part of that, one in Snoqualmie, one in Chehalis. Echo Glen Children's Center in Snoqualmie serves our entire female population, ages 12 to 25, in two cottages respectively, and our male population, age 11 to 17, and these I will note are identified um, genders. Our safe operational capacity at Echo Glen is 112. Echo Glen sits on uh, acreage. It's a number of cottages sort of spaced out, about 16 bed cottages spaced out, and the sentence ranges there are, are minimum through maximum sentences. Uh, our Green Hill School in Chehalis, which we'll spend a bit of time talking about today, serves our male population, 17 through 25. Again, serves a minimum through maximum security classification population and has a safe operational capacity of 180. Today, the population there uh, is uh, 225. Um, you can see some historic number of historic data on folk, on young people served through fiscal year 25 at the top as well. Uh, in addition to our institutions, we have eight community facilities. These are residential community-based houses throughout the state uh, that are minimum security, meaning young people attend school, work in their community, access behavioral health, mental health care in their community, engage, frankly, in their community while having a residential setting to return to um, and be part of that is structured like 24-7 care staffed by DCYF. Um, these are homes in neighborhoods. You may have driven by some of them and wouldn't notice, wouldn't know that that's what they are. They really are intended to be that uh, that community-based house home-like setting that supports the transition and the re-entry. Additionally, as I noted, we have community transition services that we just launched in May after extensive work on our risk assessment redesign as required by the law and, and really designing a new program that is about serving the latter part of your sentence back in your community with that wraparound care and support. Um, we launched in two counties, Pierce and Spokane. We are launching um, thoughtfully and judiciously, as this is a new program for DCYF, it's a new program for our staff and the young people who are eligible, and we want to make sure we do it well and are evaluating it and looking back and reflecting as we go as to not, uh, as to ensure it is successful for, for young people, for us, for the state, really about young people's success, balancing public safety, um, and the success for the, for, for the continuum in this space. And we are proud to note now we have reentry programming for all. Some of that is mandatory parole provided by us or DOC, depending on the, the sentence type or care and custody of a young person. And some of that is voluntary. We have community-assisted community, community assisted reentry that is available and voluntary for all of those exiting JR who are interested. That's that ongoing wraparound case management support. So what might a young person, what does a young person experience when they come to DCYF? All young people who come to DCYF have a sentence that is adjudicated longer than 30 days. 
Um, juvenile sentences often range in that 15 to 36 week range. Uh, some juvenile sentences absolutely exceed that. And then we have adult sentences, which tend to be longer. We have a slide later that we'll talk about that. So initially when a young person comes, we intake them from their county of origin or their county of adjudication. We do some initial conversation with them while they're in the county facility, do an initial intake, and then they are placed at either Echo Glen or Green Hill School. They have to begin their sentence at a secure institution that is required. Once they're admitted, they receive a series of screenings that include medical, mental health, uh, risk assessments uh, around harmful or suicidal behaviors, um, behavioral health, what is their opioid or, or drug treatment needs potentially, et cetera. This will determine not only their security classification, but also the programming in which they will likely begin and engage with, the treatment that will be offered, et cetera, as they land at either Echo Glen or Green Hill School. They're assigned a living unit, a residential living counselor, um, and then we have a new expansive family handbook uh, linked on our website uh, that we're happy to share out that walks through the continuum, what young people and their families can expect when they're in our care and custody. You can see a snapshot there on the right, what you experience in your first week, your first two weeks, your first 30 days, and then every 120 days, what that looks like with the ongoing need and risk reassessment. One of the other questions we were specifically asked is how do people exit? Or how might a young person leave, especially one of our secure settings? There are three ways in which a young person will exit one of our secure settings. They are released because their sentence has ended. For juveniles, they come to us with a range of a minimum and max. We release on the min unless there are minimum unless there are extenuating circumstances that would uh, warrant a longer stay. Some of that is re related to behavior. Some of that could be related to like housing needs or, or family needs, et cetera. But right now, the vast majority of young people who come to us with a juvenile sentence are releasing on their minimum. Like they release, as I noted, with that voluntary, if they choose, or mandatory parole. You can also leave Echo, Echo Glen or Green Hill School by transferring to a less restrictive setting, a community facility, as I noted on the previous slides, or to the Community Transitions Program. You also can leave the secure institution by transferring to DOC. All young people with a sentence that goes beyond their 25th birthday will transfer to DOC with a few minor exceptions of those that may be eligible for CTS, although that number is quite, quite small. Um, you also can transfer to DOC voluntarily before you turn 25. You may have maximized the programming available to you at Green Hill School or, or are looking for a different experience. There may be a uh, setting closer to your home. There may be more work or career opportunity, more educational opportunity. So you may choose to volunteer. Um, or we do have a process uh, through a settlement where young people are transferred to DOC um, if they create a safety risk or danger on the Green Hill campus. I wanna be really clear, for a young person that comes to JR and has a sentence that exceeds their 25th birthday, they will, ex they will spend the entire duration of their sentence at Green Hill School. There isn't another option in the continuum once they are turned 17 and are male to have a different experience. The same is true for females at Echo Glen. If they have a sentence that exceeds their 25th birthday and they will transfer to DOC, they will spend that entire duration of that sentence either in, in Echo, at Echo Glen for that female population or at Green Hill School for the male population. We, get, we have some questions as we got some questions as well around community facilities and why why aren't there young more young people in community facilities? Um, I want to take um, a moment. To Allison, I see yes. Senator Warnick has a oh, question. Great. Thank you for interrupting me. I can't see the hands. Yeah, no, that's yeah. okay. I'll keep my eyes on it. I hope it's Thank okay. You. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Could you clarify, Allison, what you were talking about, the duration of sentencing? Um up to age 25 and after. Um, yeah. I'm aware of a couple of um, <clears throat> cases uh, that uh, just recently happened. I don't know what they're going to, what the sentence is going to look like, but they're juveniles that have committed some pretty um, uh, hefty crimes. So I would think their sentencing is going to go past 25. So are you saying... <clears throat> they will be uh, <clears throat> sorry. They will be sentenced to Green Hill or JR, and then continue their sentencing even after age twenty-five. Yeah, so I can't obviously speak to specifics, but but yeah. the way the structure and the laws work, <laughs> if you committed your crime under the age of eighteen, so as a juvenile, right. and if you were sentenced either as a juvenile or an adult. You come to juvenile rehabilitation, DCYF care and custody, until you are 25. 
So for those that have a sentence that exceeds their 25th birthday, they are with us until 25. For those who have an earned release date before their 25th birthday, regardless of adult or juvenile sentence, they would release directly from the care and custody of DCYF. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Clarify. It is, it is very, I have thought for many years, how do I have a visual that depicts the sort of variety of types of of sentence length and sentences and and age that depicts the population we serve, um, it's very complicated. It's a very complicated puzzle. So yes, happy to clarify that. Thank you for asking the question. All right, so community facilities are for those who have a minimum security classification or minimum security eligibility. Not everyone is eligible for that. As I noted previously, if you have a sentence that exceeds your 25th birthday, you are not ever eligible for a community facility placement. You will spend that entire sentence at at one of the secure institutions. I also want to note that our community facilities are um, not all equal in the sense that uh, a bed is not a bed is not a bed. One of them is for the female population. A couple of them tend to serve the younger male population, that 14 to 16, and then the remainder serve that older population, 17, 18 to 25. We also have one community facility that is specific to a manufacturing academy program. So you are there for the duration of that program, and then you transfer to another community facility. I name that because it's important to note that especially in this moment, a bed is not a bed is not a bed, right? The bed's have to match the type, the type of um, eligibility needs to match the beds available. Uh, So here's a little bit more on the community facility space, as I noted, and some notes on our community facility review process, which we did just update in January, really to identify and make sure the right young people are ready and the community facilities are ready for them. We have seen great success on that. Now I'm bouncing between slides, I apologize, but you can see some of the data on those reviews um, since January and the, uh, the reality of trajectory there. So we have reviewed through the new MDT process or multidisciplinary team process, 110 young people of those 91 were recommended for placement. Of those, the vast majority have been placed in community facilities. Um, Some are pending that transition due to notifications of time, et cetera. We have reviewed 10 for community transition services or CTS. 10 have been recommended and I believe there have been about less than five have been placed to date. We can follow up with specifics. So that's a little bit about community facilities. And with that, I'm gonna pause and turn it over to my colleague, uh, Jenny Hedden, to talk through current realities and some of the data. Thank you, Allison. Uh, And thank you um, for uh, allowing us to be here this afternoon. It's been a while since I've been in front of the oversight board. So it's nice to see uh, many of your faces uh, again here. Uh, Jenny Hedden, I'm the Deputy Secretary Chief of Staff for DCYF and have been uh, working quite a bit on some of the issues related to our juvenile rehabilitation and uh, our Assistant Secretary will be joining here shortly after my part part of this presentation. Um, So we have had uh, years of declining juvenile crime and incarceration and you know that appears to uh, be both related to underlying less commission of crime as well as I think you know changing thinking in our society about how to handle uh, juvenile offenders. Um, And so we have seen really significant decreases in uh, recent years, um, a 60 percent. We've seen decreases. And right now in this recent year, though, we have seen that trend begin to change with a 60 percent increase in intakes to JR of young men in particular. Jenny, I see that Rep. Dent has a hand up. Rep. Dent? Thank you, Senator. So, uh, hi, Jenny. This is some interesting um, data you have here. So, so the second bullet point, so, and I may be young, but have you a little bit, but recent no, data please. from the Washington Association of Sheriffs Police Chief indicates a 24 increase, 24 percent increase. Uh, well, I, I don't think that just happened in one year, did it? Is that uh, over a period of one, two, three years? Yeah, we can get uh, certainly some additional uh trend data. This is actually a new sort of relationship that we are forming at DCYF with our Washington Association of of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs to really try to get an understanding of what is coming. Um, And I see that uh, Barb Serrano has has joined as well, because I'm sure she has some insight in this. But this particular set of increases that we're seeing actually really are 
um, for sort of current calendar years. These are, and you'll see this as we move through some of this data, that this is actually a, a fairly dramatic change in trend that is fairly recent uh, in this data. But um, I'm presuming, Barb, that you're going to add uh, other context here. <laughs> Yes, um, th that is a 24% increase year to year. So March 2023 to March 2024. So yes, unfortunately, that is one year increase. So thank you, Representative Dent, for taking my second bullet <laughs> um, here. So we are definitely, again, seeing this real dramatic change in trend um, in what is happening out in communities. And again, just want to you know harken back to uh, what Allison was showing, that JR exists at the end of a very long uh, tail of events that we do not control. And so we are sort of... Um, trying to do a better job of being able to predict what is happening and having conversations with counties and others about what is happening in those county environments. We are also seeing that not only is there a fundamental sort of increase in arrests uh, and increases in charges, but we're also seeing that sentences courts are actually sentencing more youth and that those sentences are longer um, for youth that are committing crimes. And all of this has um, increase in intakes to has led to a population growth in our JR facilities and at Green Hill School in particular. And we'll have a chart here in a second, but I see um, Ben DeHaan has a hand up. Hello, Jenny, nice to see you. Yes. Uh, just a, a quick question of the 24% increase is, uh, what percentage of those arrests occur for people who have already been through your system as opposed to a new crime? We don't, I don't think they have that particular slide in this deck, but we actually do have this data to talk about uh, intakes um, as they're coming in, in terms of who have we seen before, who is a new admit. I will say, spoiler alert, when we are able to send that data, most of our young people being admitted to our system are new to our system. We certainly see sort of um, reoccurrence. I think we also see, and, and Barb, uh, feel free to correct me, you have a much better handle on sort of the local experience, but what we see is sort of escalation of behavior over time. So a young person may have multiple encounters with their local county at lower level crimes, and then finally have a crime that is significant enough that they will have a sentence length that lands them um, uh, to in coming into JR. And I'm sure Ross has additional information to add to this picture. Thanks, Jenny. Well, Ross at least has an opinion. Um, one of the things that's weird here is mostly we're talking about Green Hill, which is our older youth. And so if they leave us, uh, they start with us at 17. They're likely to be with us until they turn 18. Uh, and if, sorry, if they recidivate at that point, they're going to go into the adult system. Uh, so we wouldn't see them anyway. So us ask, answering a question about recidivism in the juvenile system is is probably not a, a, to answer your question for reals. I think somebody needs to go get a PhD, and it's I, so. I, and I'd love to spend the time drilling into that, but it's a it's a deep and interesting question, and we don't know the answer. The next slide. Um... So who are we serving in uh, our JR system? So nine out of 10 of the young people in JR identify as male. Um, that's 93%. So overwhelmingly a male po male identifying population. Um, also young people of color are the majority of uh, individuals in our juvenile rehab. So 66% clearly uh, disproportionate to the overall population um, if we look at, at the um, race and ethnicity of young people in Washington state overall. And then uh, what we are seeing, and of course, some of this has been changing in relationship to the law, the law changes that Allison referenced, 57% of our young people in JR now are age 18 or older, and 18% um, of them are actually age 21 and over. So that is sort of that new population that we are serving after the legal changes. We can go to the next. Yep. The uh, And as we see that change in population occur, it is also uh, changing the sort of mix of young people that we have uh, in, in the institution in terms of their sentence uh, length and sentence um, sort of types. 
So this is showing over time, going back to state fiscal year 2018 uh, through state fiscal year 24. And uh, we're showing how our mix has changed from those uh, back in 2018, 85% of our young people had a juvenile sentence. And now you can see for state fiscal year 24, which we just uh, wrapped up, 66% are have a juvenile sentence and now 34%, so a growing percentage, have an adult sentence. And that has also corresponded some of those changes with an increase in length of stay. That that data is a little bit um, uh, alters. And I also just like to note that we anticipate continued changes in this mix because it does take quite a while for some of these cases to work through. And there was a lot of disruption to the county court systems during COVID. And so we're um, certain that we will continue to see changes in this mix over time, um, at, and especially as the population grows. Jenny, can I just ask a question on the slide before on the demographics, whether that um, has changed on the who we're serving? Uh, post-pandemic and um, since this explosion or whether uh, those um, realities have been just um, historic as we look at um, our disproportionate populations? So um, these are, uh, it would be an excellent question for us to look into and we'd be happy to see sort of in, especially this big increase that we're seeing recently, are we seeing a different um, uh, young person show up? Uh, at our door. And um, so that is a question that we are definitely happy to do some digging into. Overall, these trends have been fairly consistent. It is largely male and it is largely uh, young people of color that are in this system. And what you're seeing is that sort of um, the system is also getting older, right? So uh, I think especially as we have done more diversion uh, and those types of activities with younger clients, what we're seeing, you know, younger people that are involved in their county systems, we are tending to see um, very few people, young people that are in those younger age ranges. And then with a, a JR to 25, we're seeing just a continued growth in that older population. And I'm, ex I'm extremely interested because in my community, it's the 10 to 13 to 14 year old right now, especially as we look at more violent crimes that um, our communities are very, very concerned about. And so I'm just curious as we think forward, um, perhaps what kind of um, disaggregation we may want to do to look at um, some changes and where we need to do some programming or thinking a little differently. So thanks. I really appreciate it. Yes, absolutely, Senator Wilson. And I, I would just, you know, you're, you're getting right to the heart of the things that uh, we have definitely been spending a lot of time thinking about at DCYF, which is, um, you know, how are we doing this diversion? And really, what is that interplay between the counties and the state? We, you know, I think what has become clear to us in the um, challenges that we have had over the last many months is that the state really is still running a significantly bifurcated system where things are happening at the counties and things are happening at JR. And while we have great relationships with our counties, we don't have a lot of insight. And I think we have an opportunity to ask ourselves collectively, what do we want for this system? What are our policy objectives for the system as a whole, not just one side or the other? So look forward to more conversation. And then we can go to the next step. So our uh, current forecast, and this is actually from the Caseload Forecast Council, produces a formal forecast. What they produce is a forecast for all of our JR population, and they do it typically mostly informed by historical trend of what has happened in the past. So this is one area where, uh, especially when trends change, it can be sometimes challenging to make sure that the forecast keeps up with those changes in trend um, that are happening on the ground in counties. What you can see was a long decline um, so if this goes, but this goes back to July of 2017, and we had a long, long decline until we really reached the bottom of that around January 2022 to July 2022. We were then projected to go up uh, in this forecast. We knew that it was part of what um, was assumed as doing JR to 25. Uh, and we're happy to talk more about this. But I think some of the thinking that we had um, was that this increase in population would be able to be absorbed into some of those least restrictive environments. And that has uh, proven to be challenging as um, as Allison pointed out. And Ross is pointing out that, that there has historically been even more. We only went back to 2017. So you're not even seeing the totality of this uh, long-term decline. 
Any other question? additional questions? Do, yes. Um, so for this particular graph, is this the total population in JR or is this the people that are presumed to come in and then we also need to add into the ones that are already in JR? No, this is the total headcount that's available or that is in the um, whole JR system. Um, and so this is not, we will show a chart here sh uh, shortly in a second, Danielle, that's, that is of the, um, intakes essentially. So what is, you know, which young people, how many young people are coming into the system? This is actually representing the entirety of the population. So we can, you can see we were just slightly above 300 young people at our lowest point in the entirety of the juvenile, juvenile rehabilitation system. And so we can go to the next slide that is really a, a depiction of what's been happening in our different institutions. So that was the overall trend. As you can see, your experience of JR uh, will differ depending on which uh, setting you are in. So we saw our green, that green uh, line that declines and goes ultimately to zero was our nacelle youth camp um, that ultimately was closed. And you can see that we had sort of a declining population in our nacelle uh, location. And then ultimately that, that system was closed. We have a yellow line that is our community facilities that Allison talked about earlier. And then the red line is Echo Glen, um, which serves that younger population as well as females. And then you have the purple line is Green Hill School. So you can see that we declined uh, overall in nacelle and ultimately again closed that facility. And then we have actually a fairly steady experience in community facilities, how many young people are being served there, and also in Echo Glen, and where we see the dramatic sort of rise and which institution is actually taking the bulk of those in, um, of that caseload forecast increase that you saw in the previous chart is Green Hill School. And so that is where um, our sort of overpopulation crisis is currently happening, is really at our Green Health School. And that is related to a number of factors, um, but some of which is that that is the institution that serves those older males and those with longer sentences. And so that's uh, part of why we're seeing such an impact to that particular institution. Echo Glen and community facilities have more sort of flow associated with them. So young people come in, they stay for a shorter period of time, and then they leave uh, at those facilities, whereas Green Hill is steadily increasing because um, we are getting new young people and the other people that are already there are not leaving um, that system, partially because of their, their lengthy sentences. Jenny, can you speak to what population used to be at NACEL and uh, the the decrease? Because I know there's some potential question in the um, from board members, especially around we close one, and as we think about space and such, um, is what kind of a facility is this compared to what we're looking at in our uh, medium security spaces and such? Sure. Uh, so Nacelle, it was a uh, medium, technically a medium security facility. That said, it uh, has a similar setup to Echo Glen, you know, lots of co cottages spaced out. Uh, and there is no fence uh, at, at Nacelle. So there was no physical security um, around the property. In addition, uh, for those of you who know where Nacelle is located, it is uh, fairly remote. It was originally designed really as um, essentially a work camp and to be training people uh, for jobs like logging, et cetera, um, that they would potentially be going into next. Uh, and we found it increasingly challenging uh, to be located in that in that location, uh, and because we couldn't get access to the kinds of uh, SUD, behavioral health supports out there, it was also very challenging for our young people's families to visit them uh, in NACEL. If you wanted to take a, a, a bus and you were dependent on public transportation, uh, and you were, say, coming from King County, that was a very lengthy uh, and potentially costly experience for you as a family. So there was definitely interest in that the facility did not really meet our needs. And we recognize that uh, given um, it is challenging to have a two institution system given the uh, lengths of sentences that we're seeing and the rise in the population at Green Hill. Thanks. I just think it's important for, you know, yeah. just information and kind of the why, um, because Oftentimes there is, you know, there's, it sounds very much easier oftentimes than it is as we think about 
the needs and the population and the geography and all those things. So thanks for allowing me to, to wonder. Thank, thank you, Senator Wilson. We also had great difficulty getting staff there. Um, you know, the remote, it, it's just challenging in, in all, all fronts uh, to do. And it's uh, an expensive piece of physical infrastructure to manage and keep current. Let me go to the next. So uh, this is the, I think, going to get at your question uh, earlier by looking at just who's coming in the um, uh, into our JR system. So you can see, again, we had this sort of declining admissions. Uh, and then you see uh, in calendar uh, year 22, that start to um, shift for us. And so we see in calendar year 23, and then we are doing a projection for calendar year 24, because obviously we have not completed that. Um, and this gets to this, so that green line is first admits uh, to our system. Uh, they certainly could have had system involvement and likely did uh, at the county level, um, but they are first admits to, to us. And then uh, we also had some... Uh, challenges, I think, especially when JR to 25 was created about where should they go, DOC or us. So you see a red line that was about actually DOC sending young people to to us as we got that um, figured out and make sure that that, that is correct and happening um, correctly. Then you see purple line is parole revokes. So when somebody is out on parole and has a violation, they will be revoked back to uh, the JR uh, institution. And so that is counted as an intake. And then we also have blue, which is our um, readmits, uh, which sometimes can be um, uh, situations, for example, where somebody went to a community facility and was not successful there. And I just like to point this out as, as a success story for uh, JR with us tightening up the process by which we select which young people go to community facilities. We're making, we're doing a better job at predicting who's going to actually be able to be successful. And that's important because it's traumatic for a young person um, to potentially have gone to a community facility settled in there and then um, have a situation where uh, they they weren't really ready to be there and they committed another crime uh, and they end up having to come back to the institution. Uh, in addition, obviously, that's hard in the local communities as well. And so we want to be really thoughtful about that. And you can see in those numbers that we've actually been decreasing that blue line over time. We can go to the next. So Echo Glen, um, it, we have this... Uh, a, what we're calling the safe operational capacity, um, uh, which we have now developed for both Echo Glen as well as for Green Health School. That is that red line. And that, um, while it goes back in time, it's actually a relatively new um, concept for us. We have tried different ways to talk about how many young people could we possibly have at a facility? Sometimes that has been calculated as how many beds do we have? Sometimes that has been calculated by what are we funded for in our forecast? And what we've really tried to get to and, and have had done this through reviews um, by professionals of our system is to make some recommendations about um, uh, what we can actually safely, uh, how many young people we can safely have in the facility, especially given the challenges that we're having around our staffing levels, given the level of acuity that we're seeing with young people. And, and I will also say that our partners who have helped us work on this and our national experts would actually prefer these red lines to be lower. We are attempting to make these a reasonable number, um, but they do represent our best efforts and thinking about how many young people can really be housed safely at any particular institution. So for Echo Glen, um, you can see that, and we have successfully <laughs> stayed below. Um, I think we reached our, our safe operational capacity at one point um, uh, here recently, but then dropped back down and we have been underneath that. If we go to the next slide. Uh, we have Green Health School, where you can see that we have been above that safe operational capacity, which for Green Health set at 180 young people. Um, for since July of 2023. It is important to then oh, notice that um, uh, 
we were certainly above that uh, for some time before DCYF decided to take the actions that uh, Secretary Hunter will reference uh, and discuss later in the presentation. Um, but as you can see, for quite a while there, we were above the safe, op safe operational capacity, but not but really kind of holding steady at around those that 200 mark. And then you see that dramatic increase that you know, it was very conveniently occurred after the legislative session in 24, um, where we now started to see a population that was, you know, 231, 235, edging closer to 240. And just to be clear, at 250 young people, we start to not only double bunk, so have, you know, we already have two people, potentially two young people in a room, but at 250, we actually have to put young people on the floor, so to speak. So in uh, boats, sleeping boats, et cetera, um, and it becomes extremely challenging uh, in the facility um, at that. And you'll also see in the next slide here um, what happens when we get into these higher populations. When we are overcrowded, and especially overcrowded and understaffed, uh, and this is not just our experience, this is backed up by research across the country, we know that we see extended room, room confinement um, because it is challenging to manage that many young people in the facility. That increases incidents, bites, assaults. It impacts the youth and staff's perception of safety. So people are more fearful. They have more safety concerns, both again from staff and from young people. Um, and it kind of just deteriorates the living conditions. So for example, when you have every single room full, you cannot move young people around to like repaint a room um, or deep clean it, uh, it becomes very challenging because you have no other place for that young person to be. Um, it also affects the staffing ratios because again, our staffing has stayed largely the same and we will talk about later in the presentation, one of our asks is to make sure that we have the resources sufficient to flex up uh, our staffing levels when we see an increase in population. That is not how our budget works today. Um, we talked about double bunking, uh, and, and then certainly, again, it is just harder overall to do the types of programming and rehabilitation work that we want to do, build relationships, get young people into education, et cetera. What you see in the chart is aggressive act counts, um, and I want to be really clear that um, so this chart is clearly showing in, in, the, in blue is the 2023 numbers for these um, different months. And the orange is 2024, uh, 2024, and you can see that increase corresponds with the increase in the population. I want to be clear that we are not saying young people inherently got more violent <laughs> uh, in this sit situation. We want to be clear that the conditions, the systemic conditions that are present in the facility lend themselves to these types of incidences happening. And so um, I just wanna be clear that we're not vilifying the young person. This is a systemic challenge that we see in the facility and is, appears to be directly correlated to the level of crowding happening in the facility. And I see there's a question. Hi, yes. Um, my question is, do you have this data inter, um, uh, interposed on the staffing ratios. So how much of this, I know they're kind of interrelated, but can, I mean, do we know where the staffing ratios have gone and um, corresponding to these aggressive acts? We can certainly do some of that, uh, that looking. I think it is both a staffing level, a staffing issue and a sheer number of young people sharing a space issue. So it is both, but we that is an excellent question. We can certainly look at some of our staffing levels uh, and population levels overlaid with this information and provide that later. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Sorry, I'm gonna jump back in to moderate. Secretary Upton is, Assistant Secretary Upton is here. Sorry, I mean, didn't mean to promote you today, Felice, and Ross, take your job there. Um, Assistant Secretary Felice Upton has joined us. Uh, she was able to step out of her leadership uh, meeting and, and important work. So I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about some of the current realities, what we have done at Green Hill in the recent uh, months and where we're headed. And then we'll turn it to Secretary Hunter to talk through and sort of go through some of the history on the decisions that you represented, uh, reflected on at the top of your intro, Senator Wilson. And I'm just going to do a time check. Uh, we're, we're, can you, uh, do you think until 315, that would be enough time for y'all for your presentation? Yeah. And or we do can you need more time? 
No, we'll, we'll, we'll plan to wrap by then. We'll Felice and, and Ross will take 10 or so minutes. And then we certainly can follow up in writing with some of the decision package requests as well. We don't need a ton of time to go over okay. those. So we'll, we'll pause there. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. I wanted to come in and share kind of the current realities at Green Hill. I also would love to address your question uh, about the impact of staff and physical plant also, right? So we're also working in facilities that weren't built for what they're being used for, that are echoey and potentially deeply triggering uh, because they're prisons. Uh, both to the young people and the staff who work there. So I think it's an excellent point to bring up when people are short staffed, they're more likely to be fearful, which causes a cycle of fear from young people who don't feel like staff are best equipped to support them with adequate staffing. So it does become a cycle and it truly is not the young people's fault ever that th those environments are inherently overstimulating, they're inherently traumatizing, because of the function of the system as well. And I think that's really important to say as we start. Um, I am here to speak about the joint incident command that we have opened with the Department of Corrections. We are um, leading that process with their partnership. What we came in to do was set the goals, which all have to do with creating a more reliable, predictable, sustainable environment where we will see less of that triggering and change in behavior. What young people crave, what staff crave, is predictable, reliable, that is the kind of undercurrent of trauma-informed care, uh, that you cannot do rehabilitation without those things existing. Um, so what we're able to do in that Joint Incident Command is it's target succinct deliverables that we can do very quickly because we've staffed up with the help of our teammates. Um, and we're able to show people that some of these things that get young people out of cells more, get outside more. I understand they stood in the grass yesterday and did a grounding exercise with no socks on, which I hope everybody appreciates is really good for all of us. And having that opportunity in a carceral environment is rare. Um, we are implementing it. We, we started building a healing garden there uh, for lots of different reasons that is full of indigenous plants. Um, it is also producing an increased staffing boost um, and infrastructure res resources that are going to help us get those physical plants up to speed, right? Cleaner, smelling better, more, more plants in the space, more vegetation, incorporating vegetables into meals. Um, so the highlights of that Joint Incident Command post have been that we've resumed dining in the dining hall for several of the units, not all yet, but our goal is to do all. That high school classes started for fall quarter and are well attended. Uh, we did in spring do an initiative called Peace on the Hill, which was well attended. Young people got to reach goals each day of, of educational attainment. Um, an environmental focus to increase cleanliness and, and the clutter adds to chaos and so really helping everyone in the space feel good and proud of their living environment uh increased attention to our strategies and contra contraband and security so we did searches last week uh increased spaces for community with both residents and staff together uh we have been on a track and and it has been hard because of the overcrowding to get there uh, to really incorporating restorative justice into our into our system and adding these education things, uh, team members that we have added at Green Hill, which you can't really see the fruits of because of the current status. Um, and then our post-secondary classes are starting with Centralia College soon. Uh, we also, if you were there yesterday, you would have seen a lot of cleaning happening, a lot of gardening happening, just a lot of... Um, cleanliness, as well as sanitation occurring there. Uh, next slide, please. And the impact, right? So we had, we established our own incident command post prior to the joint command on May 25th, following a large scale incident on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, at that time, we had asked managers and others to be coming in more often. We also, had, during that time, had brought in uh, some national recognized partners to do some analysis of our facility because we understood that there had been deep impacts to young people that we serve uh, because of the staffing realities. 
Uh, we are seeing frequent callouts and no-shows to our facility, uh, and we have plans in place to address that. I also want to address the function of that behavior also, often as burnout post-pandemic in this work nationally, and I am seeing that with my peers nationally. Um, and we have been about 60 to 80 full-time employees uh, short through at any given time in the year. I have deployed many of my headquarters resources to the facility to fill shifts. That includes myself. Um, I have worked shifts there and I, I depend on many of my staff. We have also redeployed staff from other facilities to work there and provide leadership there. Uh, we care very much about getting this right. And we're all in with our partners at DOC. And I hope to continue uh, to report on the positive developments in short order. I will say while Green Hill School faces significant challenges, particularly with programming, there are also clear signs of progress and positive change that do hold promise for the overall environment and effectiveness of the facility that I think we have to continue to lean on and grow. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Felice, for stepping away and joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, so there were some, some specific questions asked uh, of the board uh, about what happened in July, inclusive of the intake freeze and the transfer and some of the legal landscape there. Secretary Hunter is here to briefly talk about um, recognizing time and the journey we've led you all on today, but briefly talk about some of the decisions uh, that were made and the reality and impact of, of those. I will turn it over to him. And I've been given strict instructions to be brief. Um, so we suspended entries because we were at 240 that day. Uh, I think we had bounced all, off a number a little higher than that earlier in the week. And I was terrified we were going to get to the uh, sleeping on the floor level. Uh, and <laughs> we had uh, time to, we, to not have more people arriving uh, and making a problem worse. Um, we the the chart that you saw of escalating um, acts of aggression um, makes it look very numerical and analytical. And when I do presentations, and many of you have seen me do them for many years, I tend to be numerical and analytical. Um, this was pretty scary. It was very scary and dangerous for the people involved. For the uh, youth involved for the staff involved, the youth that were just there and were not actually directly involved. Um, we're very concerned. The uh, population level made it harder and harder for us to uh, keep contraband out of the facility. Um, it, it just became much, much more dangerous. So we did a suspension on intakes. Um, Allison showed you the number of ways that people could leave uh, Green Hill School. And we needed to reduce the population. Uh, and we tried to find a way to do that that was, that balanced um, trying to create a safe environment for all 240 people. Uh, and we made a choice to transfer 43 um, young men who were over the age of 21 and had a sentence that extended past their 25th birthday. Uh, so a demographic group, it wasn't about their, anything about them individually. Uh, it was a goal of reducing the population on the campus to try and get it to become more safe and more therapeutic for the 190 or so people who were left, as well as provide a safer environment uh, for the young people who were, were being transferred to DOC and who were gonna to transfer to DOC anyway. This was just earlier than that. Um, on August 9th, we lifted the intake freeze. We did it first at ECHO, once we really got a handle on what the numbers looked like there and got enough upstream to sort of figure out what was gonna happen there. And you saw that we had we bounced off the 112 number, but uh, it was pretty clear we were we were our cycle would, would be okay there. But Green Hill, with the increasing length of stay, adding more intakes into it was making it um, concerning. So we lifted it first for ECHO, and um, we obviously were involved in a court process, and we, we came to an agreement. We lifted the intake freeze. 
um, that is going to result in um, more people coming to us and it will be um, very challenging to manage uh, on the on the ground. Um, you know, we looked at some alternatives, right? Um, there aren't very many alternatives. You could choose a different population. Uh, this is one where we believed and we still believe that we have the legal authority uh, to do that transfer in order to keep the facility safe. Um, judge disagreed with us and we're going to comply with the court order. Um, and we chose to do the transfer in the way the young men who were transferred are all serving a DOC sentence. So they are under DOC's authority and DOC did the transfer. And so I don't want to talk, uh, I mean, I think we have uh, Mr. Long here to talk about that, but how that works. Um, we uh, chose to err on the side of safety in how we did communications rather than being transparent before we did that. Uh, and uh, Mr. Long can talk about why. Yeah, good afternoon. And so um, <clears throat> it's our it's our department policy and it's um, a standard practice to not um, share when and how we transfer individuals. Um, based on the uh, the information received on the individuals that we were receiving, um, it was deemed that this was a high risk transport. Many of these individuals had um, long sentences. And so from that, in turn, we um, had our special teams uh, conduct this transport. They're very highly skilled in this type of transport. Uh, they get additional training outside of standard DOC training um, to manage uh, a population. And so in turn, uh, they conducted the transfer um, with little warning and were able to move the population to um, Shelton. Um, and then they remained there until uh, the court um, deemed that they needed to be returned. Um, and 37 were returned because six of their former residents decided to stay with the OC. Thank you, uh, Bob and Secretary Hunter, Mr. Long and Secretary Hunter. We, Ross, I'm gonna pivot to you to talk a little bit about next yeah. steps and where we go in about 120 yeah. seconds. Okay, so um, we, we can't, we can't live in a world where we have a fixed capacity and our and the, the world externally external world has changed 30 years of decline in juvenile incarceration population seems to have changed we don't really know if this is a short-term change or a long-term change in trend is this 1991 or is this just a bump post-pandemic we don't know um and but we have to have an ability to run, we can't run a therapeutic system if we can't run a safe one. And the safe one is driven by the level of population. It's also driven by level of staffing and those are involved with each other. As we get more overpopulated, our ability to staff the system is very challenged. We get call outs, we get increased use of sick leave, I, and we just see fewer people showing up to work, which is very hard to manage and results then in more confinement for young people. The population that we serve has to match the capacity footprint. Like you, they can't be out of sync. We could have extra capacity, but we can't have extra population because you see the results. Uh, and I, I don't want to have the results on TV all the time. Um, we're, we have some work to do uh, around programming that to serve a an older population that is with us for a longer time and that will be with us on the Green Hill campus. Um, our education practices have to have to change some. We have some goals around uh, therapeutic work as we've had fewer people come into the system. They have had many more behavioral health challenges. Uh, when we look at our population at ECHO, it, it looks pretty similar to a CLIP facility in terms of the behavioral health needs. Um, to manage the staffing, to get staffing back up to safe level and then to the therapeutic level, um, we have to we have to change the way the and here's 
the budget wonky Ross is the way that the forecast works with the uh, with the state budget needs to change so that the staff budget flexes with the population that we have to serve. Right now, if we get another youth into the system, uh, we get another $37,000. And uh, the average cost of a youth in the system is uh, around $300,000. And it um, the young people that we're getting, all we're seeing all the growth in at Green Hill are right. among the most, they require the most services. And that it correlates with the spending. We don't believe we'll be able to get uh, fully staffed at Green Hill without pretty significant wage increases to pay mm -hmm. um, comparable to other carceral settings, either at the county levels or uh, in the DOC system. Um, we're, we're not competitive today on that, and I think we see that in our staffing levels. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff involved in that, but these are the structural elements that we're going to need to have, uh, and we're going to need to work with the legislature to work out how to make this work. I don't, our intention is not to drop a big bill to do all this, but it's to work with you to draft that. And now um, this is where Allison controls it, not me. I think we will pause, we'll stop there. I There are three more slides that go into a little bit more detail on what Secretary Hunter provided the overview on, on the decision packages. They will also be public in about three weeks and have way more detail. So I think in the interest of time, desire for a few questions, we all have a bit of time to hang on. We will we will wrap there. I see um, uh, Ruth Cahey. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you are planning to propose any policy changes to try to deal with uh, the crowding issue. So at this time, we do not have agency request, request legislation in the works related to uh, policy changes. We do know that there's going to need to be some policy changes or additional capacity added to the system rather quickly uh, to manage and navigate. We will have a couple agency request pieces of legislation related to records, send those over, um, and records, uh, record review. Um, but but at this time, Ruth, we don't. Our desire and our intention is to work with our legislative leaders. Four Corner leadership are actively engaged in, in this conversation. Uh, policy committees, I've spoken with Representative Dent, Senator Wilson extensively, as well as others, Senator Sen, um, as well as others about the need for a real, real look at the policy landscape, both upstream and at the back end to say, how do we manage a population and capacity reality that we are in? So I don't, we we will not proactively be putting forward agency request legislation that you will see in the next few weeks. Our desire is to work with our legislative champions, leaders, you all, other advocates and stakeholders to really understand to say, how do we continue to refine and tweak and change the system so we can have safe environments that do rehabilitation, which I believe is what we all are charged with and committed to doing. And I know you've been looking at alternatives for creating more capacity at both ends of the system and just wonder, you know, how is that looking? Do you think there are some realistic alternatives to increase capacity for both diversion and for more carceral space? Yeah, I would I would defer on the diversion sort of upstream in our local local partners. Um, as far as our ability to stand up new capacity, it's really hard. There are three types of entities that sort of have buildings at the ready that can serve a population that is adjudicated. Us, ours are full, as you see. Um, the Department of Corrections, uh, local jurisdictions and county detentions or adult jails, or some rare behavioral health-like settings. These are not readily available, pre-constructed, um, zoned physical space that exists. And so, yes, to your point, we continue to say what other options do exist at this point, we don't have anything that is uh, at the ready or available to help mitigate the population realities. Sorry that we don't have more proactive update there. Thank you. Appreciate the question. I'm going to break into just a second. Um, so just to, in terms of our timing, I am, we have a, about 11 people signed up for public comment. That's going to start at 3.30. We have until then to finish up this Q&A and do any board debrief. So I just wanted to assure those who are waiting around for public comment, you will get your time. We'll start at 3.30. And now, uh, Bobby Bridge. Thanks a lot. I'm not sure who this should go to. So Allison, since you're the, seem to be the, the general in charge of this. Um, but this is a systemic issue. And um, as you and it is historic. 
Um, and you showed in one of your very first slides that you are the end of a very long and complicated chain of events that happens um, in kids' lives who get involved in the juvenile justice system. So to what extent uh, is their conversation, or dare I add, dare I hope, uh, they're actually happening, um, meetings of the other end of this system? Um, I don't mean, well, I, I mean in particular the judiciary and the um, local detention facilita uh, uh, facility um, uh, leads um, to, and, and probation uh, to the extent that that doesn't lie in, um, I think it does lie now in courts in all of the counties, but once upon a time it wasn't in the hands of King County. But in any event, um, is any of that going on? Because it seems to me without it, it's, you know, we're just spitting in the wind. So I yeah, I think that's exactly right. I can say that I have been involved in multiple conversations with system partners at the front end of the system, if you will. Um, there are a number of advocacy groups that are looking at diversion, diversion opportunities, sentencing reform upstream, in addition, have spoken with the superior court judges and the juvenile court administrators extensively um, about sort of I would say in full transparency, where we're all at sort of is the problem statement. And then what do we need to do to fix it? And I think that's going to be the next iteration of the work. DCYF is invited to and privy to some of those conversation. I would hope that some of them are happening also without us um, because we aren't as intimately involved, um, but have been involved in uh, in with the Superior Court Judges Association, the Juvenile Court Administrators, uh, WATCHCA, which I can't tell you. I try not to use acronyms, but I can't tell. I think it's the Washington Association of Juvenile Court Administrators. Um, it is. Oh, perfect. I got that one right. Um, uh, so yes, to your question, Justice Bridge, great question. They are happening. They will continue to happen. We we will convene uh, groups. We will participate when invited um, as we sort of march towards these next two to three months to really hopefully enter the legislative session with a robust set of uh, policy change that really help better support young people, both in getting what they need earlier, um, keeping them out of the system, but for those who do end up in the system, ensuring we have safe facilities that can do rehabilitative work. So well, there are, there are learning opportunities there are learning opportunities in the very um, near future with respect to the judicial side because our annual conference, which includes judges from all from all levels of court, um, meets in it's usually by the end of September. I I don't have the date oh. in my head, but in any event, I mean it's it, and the board meets regularly for the Superior Court Judges Association who have the primary. Uh, responsibility in this um, arena, but um, it just it just needs to happen. And uh, well, otherwise, we're just going to be pointing fingers at each other, I, too. I, we want to not point fingers at each other. I, I'm, I, I do want to do the um, upfront work. I think that's important to do. My concern is that the crime types that we're seeing at, at the tail end of the system are such that the the courts are going to send those young people to us. We're seeing an increase in gun violence. So you have to get pretty far upstream to stop youth involvement in gun violence. Um, once they start committing those crimes, they tend to get sentences that are longer than 30 days and we'll see them. So I think this is actually a result of increased in significant youth violence, which is really the first time we've seen this in 30 years. And I'm concerned about it. Um, and I, I want to make sure that we have a system that is resilient to actually getting more people that we really do need to serve and potentially for a long time. Yeah, but but that can happen at various levels also. And people yes, need and. to buy into that is my point. Representative Dent. Um, thank you. So looking at the presentation we made, you know, I could begin to see an increase, um, you know, in the crime rate and and with the young people that are causing some issues here back in the spring of 2022. And uh, during that time coming forward, we we worked at closing a facility and, and we weren't making any uh, progress as far as increasing capacity, increasing our FTEs and things like this. So I guess my question here is, when do we start seeing these trend numbers where you're sitting? I mean, are you seeing these early enough to make a difference? I mean, I could see them today. And I would think in, in a situation uh, dealing with uh, folks that commit crimes that we would want to see these trends uh, sooner than later. And we'd want to kind of be watching this a little closer. And the reason I'm asking this question is 
I realize that there's a, that we can threaten that our young people in these facilities that are overcrowded are in a bad place. I get that. And we can cause some issues, right? But we also, when we cannot take people and put into the facility that are still in the community, that's a threat to the community. You know, so I think it's more than just one threat we're dealing with here. And so my question is, is anybody paying attention to where the trends are actually going? I mean, even a cowboy like me can see it. I got to believe you guys got some smart folks here that can see it. Yeah, Representative Dent, thank you for the question. Um, I may defer to Jenny and Barbara on this one. I think one you're hitting the you're hitting a nail on the head around that is one of the gaps in the current data set that we have because the system is multifaceted. Is 39 jurisdictions that make these decisions upstream. There is not a certain uh, there is not a current sort of collective repository, if you will, of the upstream data of arrest data of prosecution data. When DCYF learns that they're going to get new folks, it's when they've been adjudicated and we got the call that they're ready for our intake. And so that is a problem and it's not acceptable and it cannot continue. I don't mean to be so emphatic about that. Apologies. Um, but we've but but this is a real, real gap in understanding and looking at the trends and the data and who's coming and and looking at it in in real detail around what type of sentence and age and gender? Because like I have said over and over in this morning, in this afternoon, a bed is not a bed is not a bed. And so the overall total may not be dramatically different, but that impact is greatest in that older adult male population right now. So I'll pause there. I'll turn it over to Jenny. This will be one of the things we need to solve for. How do we get that data? Who's getting that data? Who's looking at and analyzing that data? And where is it going so we can accurately predict what is necessary? We definitely want to increase the the quality, and we've had this conversation with the Caseload Forecast Council. We are having internal conversations, uh, working closely with the governor's office, and and um, Barb Serrano and I have spent quite a bit of time talking through data, looking at that. What do we need to actually collect from counties? We, we don't have, as I think many of you are probably aware, a unified data system that collects this information from counties consistently, and so uh, with the level of detail that we would need to be better predict to predictors, and I think it's important to address the reality for us, uh, and this is, we were just talking through this, we requested funding through the capital budget to simply bring a cottage that was was already there and bring it up to being able to be used again on Echo Glen's campus. We have another one that was just brought online at Green Hill School. That process often actually started in about 2018, 2019, and those cottages are just now coming online. So the time horizon to bring on that new capacity is very long. And the challenge that I see when I go back and look at some of that data, and you know, I'll say this as a sort of former Senate staffer, uh, I wouldn't have recommended additional capacity at the times where the legislature was actually meeting and the opportunities where we had the ability to ask for additional capacity. It was also not clear. It was not clear if the trends were gonna continue. It was not clear if they would increase. We saw that really dramatic increase in 24, which I don't think any of us anticipated seeing. And so I don't say all that because I don't I don't want to be making excuses. We certainly feel like we could be doing a better job of watching this data and intend to and asking ourselves harder questions about what we need to be prepared for. Um, but it this is a small system. And so so small changes have big impacts. Uh, and we need to have a lot of standing capacity in order to be able to absorb those. And that just takes a long time to bring on board. Um, and we want to get better at this. Thank you. I um, That was actually one of my questions, but I have another real quick follow up, which is, you know, when you're looking at the data and trying to predict do a better job of predicting what the numbers are going to look like, there are extrinsic factors. And I'm thinking in particular about the current fentanyl epidemic and synthetic opioids and how that, how do you see that impacting your numbers? I mean, I think it's an excellent question. And this is where we really are trying to understand what is potentially available uh, at the local level and where, um, what data points might be the most helpful to get that prediction. Um, so for example, you could track a lot of arrest data which is a lot of data, some of which will then end up in somebody actually doing charges, some of which will actually end up in sentencing. 
And so we certainly um, could do more work to understand what is the, you know, is there a, a predictable mathematic relationship between those events so that we could have um, a little bit more forewarning of what is coming uh, and, and where a change in trend is, is happening. Right now, again, we don't systemically collect that data and we haven't analyzed it to figure out what those relationships might look like. And it is something we are certainly interested in pursuing. And, and this is a weird opportunity where Jenny is going to give a more numerical answer than I am. Uh, I'm going to say I'm incredibly pleased that we offer 100% of the people who want to get medically assisted treatment, we will provide that treatment. We're providing Sublicade, which is an expensive treatment, injection-based treatment um, that, that works well. And we have had, in January, we had a couple of overdoses for, I think, that were just terrifying. We had a batch that snuck into the system. We've completely changed all of our entry protocols, bought a new scanner. Um, it is um, upsetting how many, how the different pathways to come into this system. Every corrections facility in the country has this challenge. I'm pleased that we have not had another since then, um, but it's, it's very, fentanyl is very concerning in the facility as well as out. Um, Young men in uh, at Green Hill did an unbelievably cool video about this, which I hope many of you have seen. And if you have not, we should send it out. Um, trying to inoculate young people, it's it's terrifying, and what they experience in the community is just as bad. Okay, for time, why don't we uh, let Senator Warnick be the last question at this point? Thank you, uh, Diane. Do you have the ability to say no when a student has been sentenced? Do you have the ability to say no, similar, similarly to what DOC does? It seems like some of our county jails keep keep people who should be in DOC. We do no, not. we lost that lawsuit. We, we lost that chart when we, so we attempted to, to uh, we did freeze intakes in an attempt to, as Senator, as Secretary Hunter talked about, Senator, um, we were then pretty quickly uh, challenged in the court by a number of counties in the Association for Counties, and we were not going to be successful in that it ended up settling. Uh, we do not have the ability to say no. Okay. Um, so in thinking about uh, our timing, I think what we're going to do now is go right into public comment. We um, are a little bit shy on our debrief with the board. Um, what I'm thinking of is if there's time after public comment, I think, and we have a few minutes, maybe Senator Wilson shaking her head, we can ask for a little bit more. So think about those questions that we posed, overall impressions, what do you wanna learn more about and what follow-up questions do we have? If we run out of time, I'm gonna encourage you to send those to Lysha um, and she can uh, via email and maybe we uh, she can collate them. Does that sound okay, Lysha? That sounds perfect. Okay, so in terms of public comment, I have 12 uh, uh, people listed now. I'm going to read a statement first and then we'll proceed. Um, the DCYF Oversight Board is governed by state law. Per state law, the Oversight Board's authority includes monitoring DCYF's achievement of eight outcome measures listed in DCYF's founding legislation, monitoring DCYF's compliance with applicable laws and policies pertaining to early learning, juvenile rehabilitation, juvenile justice, and child and family services, general oversight of DCYF's performance and policies, and providing advice and input to DCYF, the legislature and the governor. The oversight board does not have authority to inquire into direct or change DCYF decisions in, in individual cases. For those of you who are wishing to provide public comment to the board, we would like to remind you that the board is subject to the Open Public Meetings Act, which means our meetings are open to the public and anyone can attend as an observer. Our meetings are recorded and posted on the Oversight Board's website and will be broadcasted on TVW. We wish to inform everyone in attendance of this fact as an act of respect and support to individuals who may have a sensitive story to share or wish to express individual case details in this setting. 
The oversight board may use any information brought to the board's attention as it carries out its role of general oversight and monitoring of DCYF. So in preparation for this meeting, the board received one written public comment that has been previously shared. We now have 12 people signed up. And what I'm gonna do is um, set a timer for two minutes and 30 seconds. And I'm gonna try and keep us to that. So I will give you guys a warning at 30 seconds when you're getting close to the end um, so that we can try and get everybody everybody uh, heard. So the first person that signed Excuse up me. is- Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have a question in the room. I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. Sure. Um, there are a number of families on Zoom that would like to speak. And there is there has not been a way to raise uh, the raise your hand button or the- um, Comment section. The, the, what is it? The comment section. The comment section. The chat. They would like to speak. There's a number of families that would like to speak. Um, we should so we have, I think the way that we've, we've structured it previously is you could sign up ahead of time if you were going to present on Zoom or you could show up in person. So we don't have a way of, of bringing in everybody on Zoom to, to comment today. Um, but we were, we've got the 12 people. I think one of them is actually being promoted to panelists. What did we say? <laughs> I didn't hear that last part. Oh. So we have one person that will be presenting on Zoom, and I think she's starting us up. It's Jeanette Obelis. Great, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I'm not one of the families that was signed up, so I, I apologize. Um, but so I'm actually... Um, with Wolfsey today. Um, I'm president of Wolfsey Local 889 and the Wolfsey DCYF Policy Committee. Um, and I was signed up to read um, a letter that was approved by Wolfsey Local 889, 940, and the Wolfsey DCYF Policy Committee. Um, so workers who work for DCYF, um, because our frustrations have gotten pretty um, Hi, in regards to not being heard. Um, and we wanted to join the call for our secretary to resign. So we are writing to join the call for the immediate removal of DCYF Secretary Ross Hunter. While we recognize the acute crisis at juvenile rehabilitation facilities, Ross Hunter's failures are due to his ignorance about the work we on the front line of DCYF do and indifference to any issues that are raised across agencies he is responsible for, which includes early learning, JR, licensing, and child welfare. Secretary Hunter has failed in his responsibility to address a critical level of understaffing, which has led to the crisis in JR, increased assaults in JR and child welfare, and an increase in critical incidents. Child welfare workers are currently suffering under double, triple, and in some areas quadruple the number of cases they should have while positions remain frozen. And they are told repeatedly there is no money in the budget for additional full-time employees. Children, children's lives have been and remain on the line. The work of DCYF is critical for the health, safety, and well-being of Washington State's most vulnerable. This is why a year ago, we as, a, we as union members called for his removal and why we are renewing this call today. These critical staffing issues are the result of Secretary Hunter and others in DCYF leadership failing to plan ahead and failing to request the appropriate staffing and resources that the boots on the ground have repeatedly asked for. We all knew following COVID restrictions being lifted, we would see an increase in work from intakes increasing in child welfare, JR, and child care needs. Instead, with the passage of 1227 Keeping Families Together Act, which completely revamped child welfare, our leadership told elected officials we had enough employees to handle the workload increase, despite already being short on workers to get the job done. We did not get a single full-time employee with the new legislation, and our caseloads, unsurprisingly to the workers in the field, balloons leading to even higher. That's 30 seconds. You have 30 seconds left. Sorry. Instead, our leadership supported closing NACEL Youth Camp. Instead, our leadership repeatedly said the department was safely reducing the number of children in out-of-home care. Instead, DCY, DCYF leadership blamed assaults on ourselves and our coworkers across his agencies, not on staffing, but on failure of staff to follow procedures, despite not being able to have the staff to follow those procedures. Instead, department leadership has continued to fail to pay employees for the hours of overtime worked, 
We have seen Secretary Hunter and those under him repeatedly fail to attend meetings in order to avoid the tough conversations necessary to fix the issues within the department. While it's disappointing, it's not surprising to see this failure extends beyond meeting with the workforce he is responsible for. Despite the failures of statewide DCY- I'm sorry, I, I'm going to have to cut you off because we're going to try and get to everybody. But I believe that you, that letter has been introduced as the written comment so that uh, the board was able to read through the letter in its entirety prior to the you, you reading it today. And I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next person is, um, sorry, hold on, uh, Rashida Robbins. <laughs> Hello, thank you for having me here today. I'm here because I am a parent of a Green Hill resident and um, that facility is in need of emergency intervention right now. Someone's going to get hurt in there if we don't intervene. Um, Felice Upton Ross Hunter, with all due respect, what are you talking about? I don't care whether my son stands barefoot in grass. I want him to be fed well. I need to know that he's eating. When he calls me and tells me that he's hungry, how do I sleep? How do I eat a meal when my son is hungry in a state run facility? How are you keeping my son safe when DOC guards are in there delivering beat downs to these kids? You can say whatever you want, but the fact that you let DOC run in there and take those kids lets me know that these you're not I, I'm, how do you still have a job I'm I'm thoroughly confused there are no trauma-informed responses uh or, and practices in place for any of your staff uh and certainly not DOC my son has seen kids in there being beaten okay and then denied medical attention they sit in their rooms they call them 22 and ones. They sit in there for 22 hours a day, locked inside a room with their calls not being answered. Let out, if they're lucky, one day in the morning and one day in the after in the in the evening. They're not allowed to use the restroom. They have to go in bags and in jars. There is no running water inside these units. But you're keeping my son safe? It's just egregious. Not to mention all of the additional charges that these kids are catching when they're in there. Talk about the school to prison pipeline. You're setting them up for failure and somebody needs to intervene right now. All of the beautiful words. 30 seconds, the, Rashida. Everything that you have said, ideally, I wish that were the case. There are, There's no therapy being offered in there. These kids need evidence-based counseling that is tailored to their specific needs and they are not receiving that. My son gets a pamphlet if he sees a therapist every a few months. Now we're not even allowed to hug our kids when we go visit them. They put us through scanners like we're the criminals. We're not the ones being bringing the drugs in there. I've never committed a crime in my life and now you're telling me that I can't hug my own son? Rashida, thank you. You're at time. I, we really appreciate you coming and showing up and sharing your story with us. Shame um, on you all. We're not doing something right now. If it were your kids, you'd do something. That's right. Thank you. All right. Our next uh, public comment is Jeff the Don Dadanto, and I'm, I apologize for you if I'm not sound, saying your yes. Thank you. That's Correct me if I'm wrong. You got it. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I I feel compelled to to talk, and there's going to be lots of stories about family members and that. But I want to address specifically lawmakers and the judicial system. This is a systemic failure. A systemic failure. This is not a problem of the kids. We either we in our in our society we believe that we have to be tough on crime, but we have to have lower taxes. That doesn't work. If you want to put people away in prison, it costs money. And no lie, this is Green Green Hill is not a school; it is a prison. Okay, and and I so so if it's if it's if you're if the judicial system continues to sentence these people without any place for them to go that is an unfunded mandate and we all know how that works and we 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 see these constantly be done in in uh, uh in legislature so as lawmakers please please consider sentencing or or funding of of the system 
we can't continue to blame the overcrowding. It, it, it has to, that is a systemic failure. Um, so, and as far as solutions go, immediate solutions, right? The overcrowding, there, there are, are ways. Obviously, it would take time to find other facilities. Can we reevaluate census? Can we take a look and see if really all of those people are 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 having a a, a valid sentence? We can talk about more gun violence all all you want, but that that doesn't that doesn't explain a sixty percent increase in in juvenile uh, uh, incarcerations or or yeah. Uh, uh, so um, I I want to uh, mention uh, 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 what was it just uh, Justice Bridge that, that uh, talking about uh, sentencing reform, and I do hope that you advocate for that. I, and I appreciate talking about the, the, the justices need to 30 be 30 seconds. But somehow there has to be a connection back from the state to the counties. And if the counties want to continue that kind of sentencing, then they have to obligate either funds or facilities to, to, to do this. Because if we all sit here and say that it is the, the youth that are the ones that we are trying to protect, we are failing, failing them. As a system, we are failing them. And that's, and so, and that is lawmakers and justice. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, you're at time. We appreciate you coming in and, and sharing your story. The next person is KL Demings. Um, thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is K.L. Dennings, and I have a loved one in Green Hill. And um, I'm not going to repeat what my sister Rashida said, um, because I'm in, we all are in total agreement with what she said. Um, I really appreciate the story that was told in the beginning about Green Hill. And I wanted the address of where that facility is so those kids can be transferred there. Thank you. Because yes. that is not our kids' reality. Our kids are getting, our kids are being terrorized every day. So my question, my question to Felice Upton and uh, Ross Hunter, I want to know when you are going to step down when you are going to announce your resignations, you need to step down so that someone can come in there and turn everything around. Because we are scared. We are scared that our children, that somebody's going to get killed. So please, you need to step down. You're not doing nothing. You are incompetent. Our kids are being terrorized every day. You need to go. And I'm going to tell you right now, wherever you go, whatever meeting you are at, whatever public meeting you're at, we're going to be there. We're going to show up. This is just going to be the first of many in-person actions. We're going to show up. So look for us. And that goes for uh, Governor Ansley. We're coming. Until our kids are safe and justice, look for us. Seconds. Look for us. You want to come up? Somebody come up. Look for us. Thank you. The next uh, person is Ian Musse. I'm probably not saying your name right. It's a Jan Musse, for the record. Um, I'm really not going to repeat their stories. What I am going to tell y'all is every elected official that's on there, wake the heck up. Because guess what? Every last one of you is going to be needing elections. And believe me, you want to piss off some organizers? You got it. You've already pissed off. I don't have a community member in there that I birthed, but I have plenty that I love that are in there. And I need you to know that. I need you to know that because y'all are already 
the administration is very, very aware. And how do I know that? I was in a meeting with the administration where they were actually doing an accountability of some sort. That young person has already been shipped to DOC. But what I heard as a social worker, what KL said, where the heck is that facility that y'all are talking about? That's a real thing. Because y'all are aware. Y'all are very, very aware. The whole administration needs to go. Not one leadership needs to be sitting. And really, you should be ashamed because every last one of you has grandkids, has nieces, has nephews. And if one of your kids was in that facility, whether you're an elect or you're an employee, it would be a different story. But because these are not your children, we have all kinds of conversations about statistics. Statistics that aren't even real, because let me tell you something, as a social worker, I've seen the trend of how we can change that over and over and over and manipulate it. I'm done with just- 30 seconds. Alone. I'm not gonna waste your time. I am gonna tell you though, I am taking accountability of people that don't do nothing. So every last elected official, please prepare yourself to get out of office. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next we have is Sarah, Sarah Zire. Yeah, hi. I'd like to yield my time to a parent who didn't get to sign up. I'm an attorney with Team Child, and I've written a report to JR, which I can share with this oversight committee as well. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Hoffman, and my husband is here. We have a son who is at Green Hill. He was one of the 43 transferred. Uh, we would like to know from Ross Hunter... <clears throat> what our child did to deserve to be transferred. He had zero infractions. He was never circled for his level. He was a mentor, part of Made Men, part of Reset. And Ross Hunter says that he was terrified that there was going to have to be residents sleeping on the floor. Our son is terrified every day. Yeah, yes because of the, how they were treated the day that EOC came in. Yeah. And you talk about a high risk move and transport. I want to know how many of these boys even had one infraction, because I guarantee you not all 43 did. That's and it's a rehabilitation center. So when they make a mistake, they should be able to make it better. They've already been sentenced. They are doing what they're supposed to be doing, serving their time, and they come in and get stripped, put into orange jumpsuits, and put on a bus, and families were not notified. We found out by a text message the next morning, and when I spoke to the superintendent of Green Hill School, and told him that we were told, we don't know where your child is. And he said, well, I did. That is not an excuse for not letting parents know that our children were transported illegally. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next is Casey Wayne. Um, hi, Diane, this is Nicholas. Uh, Casey reached out to me via email and I signed her up and I've been reaching out to see if she will be joining, but she has not joined the Zoom at this Can time. I I, we're running out of time and I, I want to speak. I know, take the spot. Yeah. Get up there, girl. Go for it. Your family should speak. Uh, Can you give her My name is Evelyn um, and I was on the list too, but I drove three hours to be here and I would love to address and to speak to uh, Ross Hunter himself or Felice Upton, whoever wants to answer my questions. Um, I appreciate you, Diane, for being here, but I want an answer from them. I'm not a mother, so I, I'm sorry that 
you know, I don't feel exactly how they feel, but I am the wife to a young man that is in there who has had to grow up in the system. And unfortunately, this place is is deteriorating him mentally to the point where I am scared every single day that that day is going to be the day that we don't hear from him because of his mental health battles that he is suffering. Every single one of those kids have mental health battles that we, you guys don't know of apparently, but they have mental health diagnoses that they need medication for, that they need therapy for, that we are not providing for them, that you guys are not providing for them. My biggest concern right now in this moment is that I am gonna go visit my husband on Sunday and I have not been able to hug him in over a month. Why, why do I have to explain to my little sister-in-law that is seven years old that she cannot hug her brother? That makes no sense. So Miss Upton or Mr. Hunter, if you guys are still on here, which I'm assuming you are, can I please have an answer? When, when am I gonna be able to hug him again? Why am I not able to hug him? Because we, we all know damn well that the staff members that you guys have in that facility, they don't go through the scanners. Right. They don't get dirt. None of that happens to them. And you guys are putting in these new scanners and you guys are doing all these new safety things to prevent us from being able to be with our loved ones. What about the staff that don't care about the kids? Right. What about Chris Stewart? Yeah. Who is a, a program manager in Hawthorne and tells the kids that they're going to spend the rest of their lives in jail mm -hmm. and that they he can do whatever he wants because those policies mean nothing to him. What about those staff members and why are they not out yet? About 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes. I need to hear from Mr. Hunter. I need to hear from Ms. Upton. So do they have nothing to say? Because as far as I'm concerned, there was two letters sent out from Ms. Upton, one this last Friday, about the grass walking and about the cleanliness of the facility. None of that is happening. The kids don't know anything about that. So I don't know what you're talking about. We don't know what you're talking about. Nobody walked on grass this last weekend. Nobody cleaned their cells. None of that happened. So where is this coming from? I we appreciate your coming. I don't. I'm. I'm not sure that uh, Secretary Hunter. That's because still she doesn't call. have an answer because they never have answers to anything. Nobody takes accountability for anything, and we're going to lose a lot of our kids. And then what? Nothing is going to happen. Okay. Thank you. We really appreciate your your public comment. Um, we've got a few more on the list here. I've got Luna Williams next. All right. Um, I don't have a lot to say. Um, my experience in Green Hill has been through a program called Gateways for Incarcerated Youth, which is through Evergreen State College. Um, for a prison that calls itself a school, it's really funny um, how we were treated and how many times the program was threatened to be cut. Um, also, how Many times um, students who really were interested in being in class and learning um, weren't allowed to attend um, and how, you know, they were being punished for um, reacting to the conditions that you guys are putting them in. And um, I just also like we we can't bring in snacks, but like your guards bring in drugs. So <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Right. How about is uh, Tony Omer there? Uh, Tony is via Zoom, so I just um, yeah, I'm hello. here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Go ahead. Well, I I was shout out to Ross Hunter. Geez, buddy, I was going to give you a piece of my mind, but I guess I don't need to because <laughs> I, wow. <laughs> Um, I, anyway, Ross, uh, you probably know my name. You never did call me back. Your secretary, Barbara, she's outstanding, however. Uh, look, why don't you focus on what you need to focus on? Why don't you focus on doing the right thing in child protective services? I have three grandchildren, Honesty, A Dream, and Hasaya, whose lives have been, uh, if it weren't for the love of their grandmother, Wendy McMacken, who for no reason, for three years almost, those children were ripped out of their mother's hands and kept away from their grandmother. 
Why don't you do the right thing and focus on attitudes and lies and, and the corruption in CPS? And why don't you stop creating the very monster that you are sworn to protect children against? Look, any harmed child is a tragedy. But if you're going to participate in making children, uh, putting them in the system for what, in my opinion, nothing but money. Yeah, Ross, step down, buddy. It starts at the top. If you don't have the skills or the leadership to put your department in order, get out. These are kids we're talking about. I mean, I'm listening to these stories of these mothers whose children are in the system further than my grandchildren, and I am damned. We are damn blessed that we got them out. And you know what? The lies and the corruption and the BS that we had to put it go through to get them back with their grandmother. They were put with 30, drug addicts. 30 seconds. They were put with convicted, mur with charged murderers. I will tell you this. It's my job now to prepare them to sue this state for the three years that you ripped away from their lives. Have a good day. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Sue Han. Uh, Sue is also via Zoom. Sue, can you hear us? Hi, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, if there are any other parents or family members who would like to speak but didn't get to sign up, I would like to cede my time. I will. I'm a parent. Yes, please. Go Go please. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda Wilson, and if Felice Upton's on there, she's actually had many conversations with me for the last almost two years. A lot of false promises, false hopes, telling me that we're going to see this place turn around and have nothing but up, uphill greatness. We're going to see juveniles being rehabilitated, yet we're taking their loved ones away from them. We can't hug our kids. We can't love on them. What kind of treatment is that? What kind of help is that to our youth in there when we're the closest to them? You're taking them away. You're taking that away from them. Not to mention the food, the food. Like what kind of insecurity is that for them? They should not have to live like that. Regardless of crime circumstances, it does not matter. You call your place a school, yet you treat them like they're crap. You walk on them, you have staff in there that belittle them and treat them like crap. These, these staff are in there, to they're supposed to equip them, love on them, and show them guidance and protection, but that's not what's happening in there. And I'm also a former inmate of Echo Glen, back way in the 2001s. This is not what it is anymore. This is not rehabilitation. We have, take, we have stripped that away. We are telling our kids that they're gonna be nothing. What kind of staff tells youth in there they're gonna be nothing? What kind of person tells somebody that they're supposed to be rehabilitating that they're not gonna be anything that is literally it's sickening. What is happening in this facility is sickening. No one wants to hear us out. No one wants to call us back. And when they do, they give us false promises and tell us that they're going to change things. What we heard on here, crap. All of us parents talk to our children. That's not happening. And if, it's, if it is, is it special treatment? Are there only certain ones? Because it should be across the board. Every single person in there should have the same amount of access to rehabilitation, mental health, food, love, security, all that. It should all be right there. But as a mother who I know has a long journey ahead, I would love to see this place turn around because you say, if even if you're telling them that it's like a prison, most of the prisons I know today that I've contacted specifically are doing programs to help them rehabilitate, to come out and be better people. Monroe Prison just had an, a, a big event for people to come and have time with their loved ones and, and have barbecue. 30 and seconds. And all that. Why are we not doing this with youth? And then Maple Lane, I didn't get hear that get brought up. What happened to that? You turned Maple Lane, which used to be a juvenile facility at one point, into an adult facility. So what happened? Why are we not building more facilities for youth, yet we keep we're we see a decline in it, but we're not doing nothing about it? Do something and step down because you suck. Thank you for your comments. Um, Evelyn, are you did you already previously? Can I go again? <laughs> if there's someone else that needs to go. Yeah, yeah. and then I have Kelly Kelly Johnson too. Hi Kelly, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you all hear me? 
Yes, you're good to go. Thank you. Um, if there are other family members in the room that haven't gotten a chance to speak, I would like to yield my time to them. Is there anyone else? Nope, you're free to go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, it is abundantly clear to me today that every single one of you in this room, I wanna say especially Felice and Ross, are failing astronomically. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that these are children uh, that we're talking about. These are not statistics. Um, and you all, unfortunately, despite your uh, inability to actually do so you're responsible for ensuring their safety. It does not matter what got them there. These environments are inherently traumatizing because of the system that they are in and the conditions, the horrible conditions that we've all had to hear about today. Uh, you all said that. You all said that these environments are inherently traumatizing. So do something about it. I want to say, too, the solution to overcrowding is not expansion. We have seen that time and time again. Uh, since the 80s, our criminal system has grown astronomically, uh, but we are still combating overcrowding. When you add more beds, those beds get filled. The solution is letting people go. It is investing in community resources to actually prevent crime. When people have their needs met, crime goes down. It has been shown over and over and over again. And the people that know how to do that best are their family members that you're hearing from today. How are children supposed to heal or get well when they don't have quality food, when they are being beaten by DOC officers that are there to keep them safe, which by might I also add was greenlit by the governor, shame, okay? So if you stand by what you're doing and the conditions that these children are in, then you should also feel confident sending your children to this prison. If you're not, then make some changes. This is a systemic issue 30, that got 30 us seconds, here. Kelly. Thank you. There are many, many ways to get into this system and very few ways to get out. Y'all said that. That is an it's an issue across the country. That is a systemic issue. It is designed to keep people incarcerated. So I want to know what are you all doing to prevent the assaults that are happening on these children? Again, these are children. Uh, I want to uplift also that sentencing reform needs to happen right now. Uh, you all said that you are not doing enough Thank to you. understand the arrest rates and the trends. That means y'all are not actually investing in actually preventing crime. We demand accountability. We demand that Ross Hunter steps down. We demand meaningful efforts to deal with Thank overcrowding you, through releases. This is bad for children, families, and workers. We are going to be listening and we, watching. We will. We, we, we are not going to step down until we, we are not going to stop we, until we actually see substantive change. Thank you. We, we really appreciate your comments, you and all of the family members who showed up today and taken the time to meet with us. Um, that is the end of our public comment um, portion. I'm going to turn it back over to Senator Wilson to, uh, to close the meeting. Thank you. And I, uh, I, too, appreciate everyone's concerns, their emotions, their curiosity, their questions um, and the critical reflection and their engagement today. Um, clearly not a, a simple conversation to have, nor a simple answer. Uh, many layers and many levels and many levers, if you will. And, um, you know, I just will say deepest heartfelt appreciation. And I can only speak for myself, but it is and has been top of mind for me as chair of Human Services Committee. And I know there are others who have been thinking about this deeply as well. So it's not just as co-chair of this oversight board, but in my role also in the legislature. Um, so we'll continue to focus on solutions and trying to figure out how we uh, change the trajectory and the pathway um, and work through this um, together because that's how we're going to get to the other side. Um, a couple of things just for the good of the order is that staff will be contacting board members about board recruitment. We have eight positions that are open and we'd love help in prioritizing filling those positions. And there are particular areas of expertise that um, are outlined in statute. And so just uh, would love to have your creative thinking on folks that you may know. And so uh, I know the board will be reaching out so that we could share that information and make sure we're actively engaged in filling positions. 
And then also we have an in-person retreat that's scheduled for Friday, October 18th. And uh, with that, I just want to thank everyone for their time today. Um, I don't believe we have any other uh, further business or anything for the good of the order because we are at 4.05. Uh, if you've got follow-up questions, please do send to staff uh, so that we can make sure that DCYF has an opportunity to respond. And also, uh, I know copies of the PowerPoint um, will be available that was presented so that folks can reflect on that as well. Um, anything else, um, Diane, that you can think um, of? No, I just feel like th th there's a lot here that we still yep. have to discuss. And and I, I don't want to close this meeting without reflecting that this is just the start of a process that we're looking at. And I think... Um, I would really encourage all the board members to think about sending thoughts to uh, Lysha and, and uh, so that she can sort of track some of the next steps that need to happen since we kind of ran out of time today. Thanks. I, I would also say legislatively, you know, we have session beginning in January. So um, while there is conversation and while there's uh, work happening related to um, potential legislation and budget provisos, as a legislature, um, our work begins in January. So now it's really uh, working with agencies and working with staff and working with community on what it is and how it is that we come to solution. But as far as legislative action, um, if you will, the legislation uh, and budget proviso process is uh, something that occurs at the beginning and during session, which happens in January. So I know oftentimes people are feeling like um, individual legislators maybe not are taking action, but we have only certain ways that we do that. And so, but really encourage um, ongoing conversation and questions. So really uh, thanks everyone for their time today. And um, Co-Chair Levy, thanks for taking on co-chairship. So appreciate it. Thanks everyone. We'll, we'll see you soon.